Okay, so in this video, we're going to look at how we can actually measure the value of G using an experiment. So, um, what I'm going to look at in the video is actually what is G? And we're going to look at three different ways we could go about measuring it and look at them in terms of the uncertainty to see which one is the best method. So, first of all, what is G? So, G is referred to by two different things, but they actually mean the same thing. So it's sometimes called the gravitational field strength or the force that each kilogram of mass um, experiences on Earth. So we will be familiar with the equation W equals mg. So in that equation, g is the gravitational field strength or the number of newtons of force each a mass will experience per kilogram. It's also known as the acceleration due to gravity. So this indicates the acceleration an object will experience in the Earth's gravitational field. And they both have the value of 9.81, but uh, field strength has a unit of newtons per kilogram. Gravitational acceleration has units of meters per second squared because it's an acceleration. But if we look at it in terms of a unit, a newton is a force times an acceleration, so it's a kilogram meters per second squared. So a newton per kilogram is meters per second squared. So they're actually exactly the same thing. They're just different words to describe them. So, um, we're going to be using SUVAT equations to apply this. So if you haven't done any SUVAT equations, this is the point to stop watching this video and find out what they are. So what we're going to do is we're going to use the equation S equals UT plus half AT squared in each of the different experiments. But we're going to start all of them with the object stationary to make it simpler. So it becomes S equals half AT squared. But what's going to change in the different experiments is this is going to be in a different direction in some of them. So just to recap what the letters stand for, S is the displacement from its initial position, U is the initial velocity of the object, uh, T is the time it takes, and A is the acceleration. If we have V, that would be final velocity, but we're not really going to use it. But to put stuff in this equation, they all have to be in the same direction, and that's key for this experiment. So the first thing we're going to do is drop objects from different heights and measure the time to hit the ground with a stopwatch. Uh, so you can see I've uh, stuck some rulers to the wall when I did this experiment, so they just stay in place. And then I vary the height at which I start the ball off to take measurements. So the displacement from its original position is going to be minus h because it's going to fall downwards from an initial height of h. The acceleration is going to, in theory, be minus g because it's 9.81 but downwards and so we end up with the equation h equals half gt squared so if you plot a graph of height against time squared the gradient should be equal to half g so we'll get a value for g so let's have a think about the data we're going to collect so i used large heights in excess of a meter to increase the values of height and time to lower the percentage uncertainty in both readings so that's one strategy I use to make sure my values are accurate as possible. The other thing I did is in this equation, all the properties I put into the equation are vertical in the vertical direction. So G is vertical, so we need H to be vertical as well. So with the rulers, you can see I checked that they are at 90 degrees to the floor to ensure that they are vertical. And I did that using a protractor, but you could equally use a set square to do the same thing as well. And I sellotape them to the wall so they stay in a fixed position so I didn't need to keep checking it. Next thing I had to do is decide what object to drop. So, um, I had a few different objects that I thought might be worth dropping. So we have a table tennis ball there, a um, basically a ball bearing there. So what I thought about is, well, one of the sources of uncertainty in this experiment is going to be air resistance. So I want to minimize the surface area so we don't end up with a large air resistance. So I chose the ball bearing over the ping pong ball. Um, interesting enough, the ball bearing is also slightly heavier than the ping pong ball, so air resistance affects that less as well. Um, all good things by choosing the ball bearing. And then I thought about where should I take measurements from? And then I reasoned, well, actually, the bottom of the ball is going to be what hits the ground, and that's what I'll hear hit the ground. So I need to measure from the bottom of the ball bearing as well to make sure I've got the height correct. But when you're trying to measure using round objects, that introduces something called parallax error. So it's difficult to measure with round objects, but it's going to be really tiny. So we don't really need to worry about that too much. OK, so that's um, about select our selections that were made. Let's have a look at the data you'd collect. So 
As I said, I used big heights, so from two meters down to 0.8 meters there, but they're all recorded to three decimal places because the resolution of my meter rulers is one millimeter. We got I repeated the measurements of time three times and recorded all of those to two decimal places because the resolution is 0 0.01 seconds. And I've calculated an average time because calculating an average should help remove some random errors that might crop into the results. And then I've squared the average time. And for each of the measurements, I've worked out what my uncertainty in the time is using range over two. So you can see for each line of the table, I've worked out what the uncertainty is and then afterwards I've worked out what the average uncertainty was because I'm going to use that later on. So I've got height and t squared values. So this is the graph that we plot with the data and I put a line of best fit in and what I'm going to do now is work out what the gradient of the graph is. So to work out the gradient I need the change in height divided by the change in time squared. So you can see from the graph where I use those values from and that gives us a value of gradient of 4.9. And if we remember from earlier, the gradient is half G. So if we double that, that ends up being 9.7. Um, if you're wondering why is it 9.8, it's because the value wasn't exactly 4.9. It was 4.8, blah, 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 which is why when we doubled it, it ends up as 9.7, not 9.8. So we've got a value for G, but... A value is pointless if we don't know what its uncertainty is. So that's what we're going to look at now. So, first off, we need to work out the percentage uncertainty in our height that we measured. So the value from the graph was 1.900. Um, the uncertainty would be one millimeter from our meter ruler, giving us a percentage uncertainty of 0 0.053. So not very big at all from the height reading there because we've used such big values of height. If we look at the time as well, we calculated an average uncertainty of 0 0.024 from the table. So that's the value I'm going to use. We've got a time from, on, from the graph of 0 0.4. Uh, that corresponds to 0 0.16 T squared. Uh, so we times that by 100 gives us 6% percent percentage uncertainty in our time measurement. So the percentage uncertainty in time squared, therefore, would be 12% because it's T times T. So to get the percentage uncertainty in the gradient, we would add 12 to the percentage uncertainty from the height, giving us a value of 13% to two significant figures. Uh, if we want the actual uncertainty, therefore we take percentage uncertainty divided by 100 times by the value for G, we calculate using that data, and that gives us an uncertainty of three meters per second to the minus two. So actually, for this experiment, we would say that our value for G is 10 plus or minus 3. We wouldn't say 9.7 because we can clearly see the uncertainty is 3. So an extra decimal place is not appropriate here. So it's anywhere between 13 and 7. So not very conclusive. It's got a quite big range. So we're going to need an improved method. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to use a slope because this would be a way of making the time measurements bigger. So... That way, in theory, we could go about reducing the percentage uncertainty in the times. So that's what I did. So this is the slope I used. You can see I kept the angle small to try and make the times as long as possible. I also put two meter rulers on there to ensure that the ball bearing travels in a straight line. We wouldn't want it going across as well as going down the slope. So what we're going to do is first figure out OK, what would the acceleration be parallel to the slope? Because like I said earlier, if we're using a Suvat equation, all the properties have to be in the same direction. So to find the component of G parallel to the slope, we multiply it by sine of theta. And we also know, looking at the slope, that sine theta is going to be H divided by L using opposite divided by the, the hypotenuse there. So we get an expression for the acceleration of the ball bearing as G times H over L. OK, so if we then try and put that into our SUVA equation, our initial velocity parallel to the slope is zero. We've got our acceleration. So we can see that the displacement, which will be the length down the slope, um, is going to be equal to half times the acceleration times T squared. So I put in the value for acceleration there. 
And I've rearranged it slightly, so we've got L squared equals equals a half G H T squared. So what we're going to do is we're going to plot a graph of L squared against H T squared, where again the gradient will be G over 2. So that's what we're going to do. So like just as before, I've collected my data. So I've calculated the distance it's traveled parallel to the slope in each one, which is L. I've calculated the start height of the ball bearing in each cases, or measured it, sorry. And I've measured times for each of those scenarios three times, got an average, and then calculated the values that I need. And then you can see I've worked out again what the uncertainty in the time is in each of the measurements to give me a value of 0 0.011 seconds there. Okay, so we put um, L squared against HT squared. And we again are going to go through the same process. So I worked out what the gradient of my graph is, and it's again 4.9. Uh, but this time, when we times it, the unrounded number by 2, it ends up as 9.8. So that's the value for g this experiment gives. So we're going to do exactly the same process as before. We're going to work out the percentage uncertainty in each of the things to see how what that would give us for the uncertainty in g. So percentage uncertainty in height, I've worked out the same way I did before, using the resolution of the ruler divided by the value times by 100%. Percentage uncertainty in L, again measured using the ruler, so uh, that's just one millimeter divided by the meter times 100. And we use the average uncertainty in the time again divided by the value we used, again gives you percentage uncertainty of time of 1%. So we are going to then combine those together to give the percentage uncertainty in G. So L is squared, which is why we've got 0.2 instead of 0.1. T is squared, which is why we've got 2 instead of 1. But height is just by is normal. There's no power, so it's just 0.57. So our total percentage uncertainty is 2.8%, which when we convert that back into an uncertainty gives us an uncertainty of 0.28 meters per second squared. So we can see we've m much improved this experiment. So we've now got a value of 9.8 plus or minus 0.28 meters per second squared. So we've massively lowered the uncertainty by increasing the times using a slope there. But we can always improve it further. So that's pretty good. But let's see how we can make it even better. And uh, what we're going to use is a system so we actually don't have to do any timing with a stopwatch because, quite frankly, humans are rubbish at taking measurements. So the system we've got here, the ball bearing starts at the top between two metal contacts. So when you release the ball, the contacts are broken and so the timer, which we can't see there, starts. So we don't even have to make a judgment when it starts, it measures when it starts. When the ball hits the bottom, the switch is currently open at the bottom. So what happens is the ball lands on that trap door, closes the switch, and the timer stops timing. So we don't have to judge the end point either. So humans are not involved in this at all, which is great. Just showing you in a little bit more detail what the device at the bottom looks like. So to start with, on the left, we can see that the switch is open. And when the ball lands, it closed that switch, which sends a signal to the timer to stop timing. And we've eliminated the human from the experiment, which is great. So doing this, um, again, I didn't use such big heights this time because we're not using a human anymore. It doesn't matter too much. So got all our heights three times again, average time, T squared. And again, I've calculated the uncertainty in the time, which you can see is much smaller than it has been before, giving us a smaller average uncertainty than we've had before as well. So this was all in the vertical direction. So we're going to basically do the same graph we did for the first h against t squared. We're going to calculate the gradient of this graph, which is 5.0, giving us a value of g of 10 meters per second squared calculate again our percentage uncertainty which is exactly how we've done before we're going to double the percentage uncertainty in time because it's t squared so our percentage uncertainty is 2.3 percent which gives us an uncertainty of 0.23 meters per second that's two so our value of g is 10 plus or minus 0.23 there so we've actually managed to reduce the uncertainty even though we used smaller times and smaller heights with that system so if we compare 
of our measurements together. So from the first experiment, we can, or the second or third, we can see we got values of G very close to 9.81. So they could all give us a pretty decent value, but you'll notice the, the distinction is the uncertainty. So the last experiment gave us the smallest uncertainty in our value of G, which is why it's the best method to use in terms of uncertainty, because the range of possible values for G the experiment gives is much, much smaller there. But for all of the experiments, 9.81 is inside the range of possible values. Therefore, all of these experiments confirm G is 9.81, which is great. So just to conclude, so this is what we should be able to do at this point. You should be able to tell me what G is in terms of the two different ways we talk about it. You should be able to describe three methods we could use to measure G and in terms of how they work. And each of the experiments, you should be able to calculate the uncertainty in the value of G that you determine and use that to explain which is the best experiment there. So that concludes this video. Thank you very much for taking the time to watch. Um, I hope you found that useful. If you have any questions, please feel free to comment and ask me. I'll try and get back to you as quick as possible. But as I said before, thanks for watching.